Assalamu alaikum this is Dr Hasna with Hasna's Nat Me before you watch this video do not forget to subscribe to my channel because most of the views that i'm getting are from non subscribed viewers so guys i can request you all to subscribe to my channel so let's get started with our next topic in abdomen we're going to talk about the muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall and these are five in number including three flat muscles and two vertical muscles so before we get started about the muscles of anterolateral abdominal wall i would like to give an overview of certain things that you are going to come across through the video and let's just get them out of the way so as i said we have five muscles we have the three flat muscles and we have the two vertical muscles in the three flat muscles we have a, what you call the external and internal oblique and the transversus abdominis two vertical include the rectus abdominis and the pyramidalis so basically guys what happens is when you dissect your abdomen you come across the skin then superficial fascia and then you come across the muscles so the first muscle that you do in fact come across is your external oblique once you dissect the external oblique is when you come across your vertical muscle the rectus abdominis just on the sides of the rectus abdominis you can see the next muscle which is the internal oblique and when you remove all of that you will come across your muscle the transversus abdominis so that's how the muscles are arranged so the next point of overview is that guys all of these muscles external oblique internal oblique transversus abdominis these end in aponeuroses so it's like a sheet of fascia that is formed these muscles basically have a belly however when the mid clavicular line is reached up to the median plane these muscles are basically forming aponeuroses they are no longer muscle bellies they are aponeuroses so on both sides of the median plane the similar is occurring as these muscles form the aponeuroses the aponeuroses of these three flat muscles meet in the midline and they decussate and interdigitate with each other they form a median raft or fibrous a median fibrous raft this is known as the linea alba once again linea alba is formed by the aponeurosis of the three flat muscles of the abdomen meeting or decussating in the midline above from the xiphoid process all the way till your pubic symphysis below all right another important point about these aponeuroses is that the aponeuroses are divided into a superficial and a deep lamina all right so from one side the superficial lamina of the right side will interdigitate with the deep lamina of the left side and this strengthen your anterior abdominal wall and apart from that the external oblique of one side decussates with the internal oblique of the contralateral side and this together is known as the digastric muscle this is also an important point so guys as you know there is a rectus abdominis muscle the lateral border or the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis muscle is known as the linea semi lunaris another important point is that the rectus abdominis is enclosed in a sheath known as a rectus sheath let's suppose this is the muscle basically enclosing this muscle is a sheath all right so that surrounds the muscle the rectus sheath is a topic that we'll talk about later in depth now let's go ahead and talk about the detail of these muscles so now that we have a brief overview about the abdominal muscles let's go ahead and talk about the first muscle the external oblique so the first point of interest in external oblique is its origin it basically originates from the lower eight ribs the middle of the shaft of these ribs so guys if this is what a rib looks like this is the middle part of the shaft of the rib so the lower eight rib middle of their shafts arises your external oblique okay it comes all the way to the front of the abdomen we've talked about the origin when it originates its fibers run as though you are putting your hand in a pocket so how are you putting your hand in a pocket they run downwards forwards and medially so this is how they run direction of the fibers is downwards forwards and medially so then comes a point where this muscle belly stops and the aponeurosis begins there comes a demarcation point where this muscle becomes the aponeurosis all right so this is the xiphoid process this is the linea alba 
pubic symphysis. Now let's talk about the insertion of this muscle. Muscle fibers itself are inserted on the iliac crest. Which part of the iliac crest? We've discussed this before when we talked about the attachments of the iliac crest. So it is attached to the outer lip of the anterior two-thirds of the iliac crest. We had the external oblique on the outer lip of the anterior two-thirds. That's how the muscle fibers insert. What about the aponeurosis? How does the aponeurosis insert? Well, it inserts in the midline from above downwards. It gets attached to the xephoid process, then the linea alba, then the pubic symphysis, and then the pubic crest, and then the rectineal line of the pubis. So now we know the insertion of this muscle. Let's go ahead and talk about its nerve supply. The nerve supply of this muscle is the lower six thoracic nerves. Let's talk about some extra points of interest of this muscle or its modifications. This muscle between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, let's assume this is the pubic tubercle and this is the anterior superior iliac spine. This muscle has a free inferior border at this point between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. This free border gets folded upon itself to form the inguinal ligament. Very important ligament. So the inguinal ligament, all right? The second important modification in this muscle is that just Above the pubic crest, it presents a defect or a triangular aperture. What is an aperture? An opening. This triangular aperture is known as the superficial inguinal ring. Another very important part of this muscle is that it forms between the linea semilunaris and the linea alba, it forms the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. And we've discussed the rectus sheath. It's basically enclosing the rectus abdominis muscle. So let's suppose this is the sheath surrounding the rectus abdominis. It forms the, the anterior wall of this rectus sheath between the linea semilunaris, which is the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis, and the linea alba. But in this portion, when it becomes the aponeurosis, this aponeurosis of the external oblique forms the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. Actions will be discussed later on in the video. Let's move on to the next muscle. Now let's talk about the internal oblique, the second flat muscle of the anterolateral abdominal wall. So this muscle will appear when you remove the external oblique. It will come in the same layer as the rectus abdominis, all right? So the internal oblique origin is quite opposite to the external oblique because it arises from below, although external oblique was arising from above. So what is below, as you can see, is the iliac crest right here. And then we have this anterior superior iliac spine up to the pubic tubercle, which is the inguinal ligament. The origin of the internal oblique is from the lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament, this part right here, the lateral two-thirds of it, and the iliac crest. The iliac crest on the outer lip was the attachment of the external oblique, and on the intermediate area was the attachment of the internal oblique. The internal or oblique originates from lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament, and from the intermediate area of the anterior two-thirds of the iliac crest, and finally from the thoracolumbar fascia that exists over here. And we've talked about the origin. So what is the direction of fibers of this muscle? Well, if you assume that this muscle has to get attached to this entire area, obviously it has to take the route of going. How? upwards so obviously the direction of fibers of internal oblique are perpendicular to the direction of fibers of the external oblique and they run upwards forwards and medially now let's talk about the insertion first let's talk about where the muscle itself is inserted it gets inserted into the lower three ribs 10, 11, 12. It, after that, this muscle becomes the aponeurosis. And where does it become the aponeurosis? Lateral border of the rectus abdominis roughly or the linea semilunaris. And the aponeurosis gets inserted into the 7th, 8th and 9th costal cartilages after which again it gets inserted in the midline running from xephoid process to the linea alba to the pubic symphysis, the pubic crest and the pectineal line of the pubis, all parts of the hip bone. And now we know the insertion of this muscle. What is the nerve supply? The lower sixth thoracic nerve plus the first number nerve.
Let's talk about the modification of the internal oblique. Now, this is where the interesting part begins. So let's divide your abdominal wall into upper three fourths and a lower one fourth. This is the pubic symphysis. This is your umbilicus. This is your xiphoid process. Now, if we split the abdominal wall into an upper three fourth, this is the lower one fourth. So how is that determined? Draw a point midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis right here. This is that point which demarcates the upper three-fourth and the lower one-fourth of the abdominal wall. Guys, once again, I'm going to draw the rectus abdominis muscle and the rectus sheath that is surrounding it, right? The internal oblique remains a single layer up to linea semilunaris, after which it divides into two layers between the linea semilunaris and the linea alba. The two layers are the anterior lamina and the posterior lamina. However, this is the case up to three-fourth part of the abdominal wall. So let's zoom in to the story of upper three-fourths of the abdominal wall. The rectus sheath at this point anteriorly covered by the anterior lamina of the internal oblique and posteriorly by the posterior lamina of the internal oblique. However, when the lower one-fourth arises this posterior lamina finishes right there it ends all right so in the lower one fourth of your abdominal wall your rectus abdominis is surrounded by an anterior lamina only the posterior lamina has disappeared the posterior lamina ends right here before the one lower one fourth begins it ends in a curved margin this curved margin is known as the rq8 line so if you are asked what is the rq8 line or the fold of douglas or the linea semicircularis more commonly known as the rq8 line you know that it is the posterior lamina's free inferior part at a point midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis so this was an important feature of the internal oblique another modification of this muscle is that it is involved in forming two important structures the conjoint tendon and the cremaster muscle now we know the modifications as well let's move on to the next muscle so now let's talk about the transversus abdominis now this is a muscle that you can say is a, a midway between the internal and external oblique it does not arise specifically from below or specifically from above rather it arises from both above and below so the origin of the transversus abdominis is from the lateral one-third of the inguinal ligament the inner lip of the anterior two-thirds of the iliac crest the thoracolumbar fascia and the inner surfaces of the lower six costal cartilages. As you can see, the direction of the muscle fibers is horizontal or transverse, just like its name, transversus abdominis. So now we know the origin and the direction of fibers. All right, this too gets before its insertion, it becomes the aponeurosis. The aponeurosis, as we all know, is inserted from above downward to the xiphoid process, linea alba, the pubic symphysis, the pubic crest, and the pectineal line of the pubis. We've talked about the insertion. Now let's talk about the nerve supply of this muscle. It is similar to the internal oblique. We have the lower six thoracic nerves, and first lumbar nerve is its nerve supply. What is a feature of the transversus abdominis is that the lowest most fibers of the transversus abdominis take part in formation of the conjoint tendon. I'm sure you've heard this word before. Yes, you heard it when, when we were talking about the internal oblique. So along with the internal oblique, the lower most fibers of the transversus abdominis form the conjoint tendon. Another feature is obviously related to the rectus sheath. As we all know that this is the rectus abdominis surrounded by the rectus sheath. So what happens in the case of transversus abdominis? In the upper three-fourths of the abdominal wall, the transversus abdominis accompanies the posterior lamina of the internal oblique and forms the posterior wall of the sheath. And it also helps in forming the arcuate line of the posterior lamina.
After it reaches the lower one fourth of the abdominal wall, eponeurotic fibers of the transversus abdominis no longer form the posterior wall. Rather, these fibers go to the anterior part of the rectus abdominis or the anterior wall of the rectus sheath in the lower one fourth. So upper three-fourths, it was forming posterior wall, while lower one-fourth, it formed the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. Another very important part of this discussion is the neurovascular plane. The neurovascular plane of the abdomen lies between this transversus abdominis and the internal oblique. That means all the major arteries of the abdomen, they run between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. It is a neurovascular plane. And when we remove the transversus abdominis, we will be able to move to the next layer, which is the fascia transversalis, which we're not talking about today. So this is a muscle and we have talked about transversus abdominis. Let's move on to the next muscle. Now let's talk about the erectus abdominis. Now this is the major muscle of the abs. You all know the six pack abs. Now, rectus abdominis is a vertical muscle of the anterior abdominal wall. It originates from the pubic crest, all right? So let's suppose this is pubic symphysis. This is the linea alba. This is the xephoid process. These are a couple of lower ribs. And this is the pubic crest. There are two heads of the rectus abdominis, a medial head and a lateral head. The medial head arises from the medial part of the pubic crest while the lateral head arises from the lateral part of the pubic crest and this muscle runs upwards. Similarly, on the other side, the same thing is happening. It runs upwards and it gets attached to the xephoid process and to the fifth, sixth and seventh costal cartilages like that. All right, as you can see in a horizontal line supplied by lower six or seven thoracic nerves. Modification in the rectus abdominis is the tendinous intersections. The tendinous intersections are basically transverse fibrous bands in the rectus abdominis. These tendinous intersections, three are fixed. Let's suppose this is the level of umbilicus. Here lies the xephoid process. The three tendinous intersections that are, are the transverse fibrous bands. First one lies at the level of umbilicus. Second one lies at the free lower end of the xephoid process. And the third one lies between these two, right in the midway. So these three tendinous intersections are mostly occurring in the anterior part of this muscle. A couple of more tendinous intersections are also present below the level of umbilicus, but these are usually incomplete, all right? So these tendinous intersections are where this muscle is firmly adherent to the rectus sheath. At the point of the intersection, the rectus abdominis gets firmly adherent to the anterior wall of the rectus sheath at this point. Hence, the anterior part of this muscle is mostly very closely attached to the rectus sheath, while posteriorly, this muscle is quite free from the rectus sheath. We talked about the rectus abdominis. The final muscle is known as the pyramidalis. The pyramidalis is a small muscle lying in the lower and inferior part of the rectus abdominis supplied by the T12 nerve inserted in the linea alba. So now we're done with the muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall. Now let's talk about their action. The first action of all of these muscles that they all support the abdominal viscera from gravity. The second action is that these muscles are responsible for expulsive acts like defecation or vomiting because when you do such act you have to exert a squeezing compression towards your abdominal viscera so these muscles by contracting they uh, carry out the expulsive act another important action of external oblique is the forceful expiratory effort such as coughing sneezing shouting or talking mostly done by your external oblique muscle and finally, in the action is the movements of your trunk. First movement is the flexion of your trunk. The flexion is carried out by rectus abdominis muscle. Second function, which is the lateral flexion, is done by one-sided contraction of the oblique muscles. Finally, the rotation of the trunk is done by a combined action of the digastric muscle as we've talked about the external oblique of one side and the internal oblique of opposite side. So if I'm carrying out the rotation of my right side, then the right external oblique will be acting as a unit with the internal oblique of the left side. So that was all for the muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall and some special important features of your anterolateral abdominal wall. Thank you so much for watching.